Hello, this is Louis Malmadrona, and welcome to the next session of Medicine for Ceremonies. In this session, we'll talk about the Sundance, the ceremony itself. And in later sessions, and in some earlier sessions, we have been and will continue to explore its medical aspects. The book that I plan to teach from today is James Walker, The Sundance and Other Ceremonies. Walker is a very interesting character. He was a physician and is reported to be the first non-Lakota, Dakota, who was trained in medicine ways. <clears throat> in his book, he writes about how the, the um, Wikasha Wakan, the, the men who trained him, made him agree not to say that they trained him until after all of them had died. So apparently they weren't sure how their training him would be received. So Walker wrote this book about the Sundance in the 1890s. And it's interesting because he gives us a perspective on the Sundance from the 19th century and also <clears throat> pre-resurrection um, of the Sundance, which happened in the during World War II, because the Sundance was outlawed around the time of Walker and either went into secret or uh, was not done. So, so we'll talk about, we'll look at some quotes from Walker and that will help us to understand perhaps how the Sundance has changed over the last 125 years. <clears throat> So in Walker's day, you one applied to to dance the Sundance, and the applicant was called the candidate, or translated into English as the candidate, and the person to whom he or she applied was the mentor. And um, so the candidate brought the chinupa to the mentor and made his request and explained the reasons for wanting to dance the Sundance. And if the mentor agreed that these were good reasons, then the mentor would accept the Chinupa and they would smoke the Chinupa together, which symbolized their agreement that the mentor would oversee the candidate's dance. And, and after that, agreement was made, there would be a public announcement of the relation of mentor and candidate. And after that public announcement, they would both enter the lodge or an ipikaga to, to vitalize. And vitalize, as I've said before, is the best translation of what happens in the anipi or the anipikaga, um, because it's more than purification, which we sometimes hear it called a purification ceremony. It's a revitalization or vitalization ceremony. So, um, so Walker says that vitalizing, which is the anipi, is an act of more or less ceremony, depending upon the mentor. And in either case, it stimulates the knee or the vitality so that the, the knee may increase the strength of the body and purify the body. So, um, and Walker gives us some interesting insights also into the Anipikaga, because he says that, that vitalizing may be merely a means of refreshment or can be a remedial measure for a disease or to purify the body for some important undertaking. And, and as I've said before, it's always done as a preliminary to ceremonies that pertain to the Wakan Tonkan or the great gods. 
So he says in its simplest form, it is done by releasing the spirit like of water in a confined space so that it may so that it may enter the body. And I I I'm intentionally using Walker because I think the language, the way he chooses to translate the Lakota into English is quite revealing. And so so they talk about the spirit like of water. And so this is this is something holy that is in the water. And they say that the spirit like of the water stimulates the person's vitality or knee so that it overcomes harmful things that may be in the body. And the spirit like of the water <coughs> washes these harmful things out of the body and they appear on the, upon the skin like sweat and can be washed or wiped away. Now notice that Walker does not say that this is sweat. He says they appear upon the skin like sweat. And this is a crucial difference. It, it's not sweat that appears on the body. It's harmful things that should be washed or wiped away. So in, in that way, vitality is strengthened and the body is purified. And he talks about um, medicines being added to the water in the case that the ceremony is for a disease so that the potency or spirit-like properties of the medicine may be released to enter the body and thereby cause the desired effect. So again, <clears throat> It's the spirit-like essence of the medicine that does the work, even more so than the medicine itself. So, and I thought this was very interesting because in Walker's time, in the 1880s and 1890s, the assistants who tended fire, Walker says, were usually women, and that the women would heat the stones in a fire near the lodge, and when the occupants were inside, would bring the stones and pass them through the opening, and then pass the water into the lodge, and then tightly close the opening. And just like we do today, those inside place the hot stones at the center of the lodge, and at inter intervals pour small quantities of water upon them. So, um, so part of, part of the vitalization of of the candidate by the mentor involves the medicines of sage and sweetgrass. And um, these, are, these medicines are burned in the lodge um, for the benefit of the candidate. And especially the bits of sage on the burning coals expel any evil powers from the lodge. And um, <clears throat> Walker translated what was called a washikan as fetish, but but it was really um, much more than that. I think I think probably either fetish meant something different in his day than it does today, or it wasn't perhaps the best term because the washikan is uh, a receptacle for spirits to enter. And, and the washikan holds potency, which is the capacity to do work um, when these spirits enter into it. So, um, and we'll, I'll say more about the washikan in a bit. So uh, once the, the sage is burned, then sweet grass is burned. And as Walker says, to propitiate the powers for good. And, and um, then the mentor invokes the power of his washikun, either by singing or praying or both, so that its, its potency or its power may help him may, in what he is about to do. So um, often one um, undergoes a, a quest for a vision before the Sundance, and 
uh, Walker wrote that if division comes in the form of a dog, a shore lark, a swallow, a nighthawk, a frog, a lizard, or a dragonfly, then it comes from the thunder spirits, or the wakia, also called the winged god, for these creatures are uh, the representatives of the thunder spirits. And they're called akasita, representatives. And when any of them speak in a vision, the one spoken to becomes Hayoka and forever afterwards speaks and acts anti-natural or as a buffoon. And we'll talk about Hayoka as time goes on further. But Hayoka is someone who has been touched by the thunder spirits and does things in a contrary way. So, uh, and in during the Sundance, those who, who are Hayoka um, act as clowns and, and try to make the people laugh and do the opposite of what everyone else is doing. So, um, because this is these this is the the way that one honors the thunder spirits. So, in those days, then the mentor would make an altar in the dwelling place of the candidate between the fireplace, which is at the center of the teepee, and the place of honor, which was in the west. And um, altars are made, Walker says, by removing everything that breathes or grows from the space where the altar is to be. So he says this is done because the altar is a sacred thing which should have nothing in or upon it except that which may be an offering acceptable to the spirits or the gods. Any other thing that may touch this space while it is an altar should either be destroyed or purified in an incense of sage and then in one of sweet grass. Altars in those days were square with four sides of equal length because each side pertains to one of the four winds and each of these must receive equal consideration in every respect. So the sides should measure not less than four hand breadths, nor more than the height of a man. At each angle of the square, a pointed space should project halfway between two of the directions. These are the horns of the altar that guard it against malevolent beings. The square space and the horn should be dug to the depth of a finger length and the loosened soil removed and freed from everything. Then it should be pulverized and replaced so as to be level. The one who replaces and levels the soil should utter and make appropriate invocations or sing an appropriate song or both. For in this manner, the altar is consecrated to the purpose for which it is made. So the mentor then placed on the altar in the dwelling place of the candidate, a buffalo skull with the horns attached so that the nostril cavities would face towards the west, the place of honor. The mentor would then decorate the skull with stripes of red paint, one across the forehead, and one lengthwise on each side of the skull. And at the same time, he paints a red stripe across the forehead of the candidate. The stripes across the forehead indicate that the buffalo god has adopted the candidate as a hunka, or relative, by ceremony. And the red stripes on the side of the skull indicate that the buffalo god will give a special protection to the candidate. Then the mentor fills and lights up a chanupa, and he and the candidate smoke it in communion, alternately blowing the smoke into the nostril cavities of the buffalo skull, thus smoking in communion with the buffalo god. So this is done in order that the potency or the power of the chanupa may harmonize with all those partaking. In, in the smoking of it. So uh, once this ritual is completed, the mentor then tells the candidate that this altar should be maintained until he enters 
the sacred lodge and the ceremonial camp, that anything placed upon the altar must be considered an offering to the spirits, and that he should so place a portion of each thing he eats or drinks, that others may also do so, and that no one should touch the altar or anything upon it except those whose hands are painted red, which is the color of the buffalo god, and that no one should step over the altar or pass between it and the place of honor if this can be avoided. This is because the altar is a sacred place occupied by the power of the buffalo god and should be revered as the god is revered. Also, um, if anything of any kind should come upon the altar, it should be removed and then be destroyed or purified in um, the incense of sage and then of sweet grass. So in those days then, the rules that governed a candidate to dance the sun dance, one, uh, he must subordinate himself to his mentor. Two, he must meditate continually upon his undertaking. He must, three, he must speak little with others than his mentor. And four, he must use only his consecrated implements and utensils. Also, um, he must not become angry. He must not hear ribald speech. He must not go into the water and he must not have sexual intercourse. So, um, so they, he talks about the Lakota, the Lakotapi being the original people superior to all others of mankind. And it is a matter of grace on their part to concede the rights of any kind to any other people. Long ago, he says, they were one tribe and made their winter camp in the region of the pines near the sacred lake, maintaining but one council fire. Therefore, if there is a dance or ceremonial lodge or enclosure of any kind, it should be placed at the center of the area with its entrance toward the south. Now, that's an interesting observation because nowadays the entrance is to ceremonial lodges or enclosures tend to be toward the east. And a society may erect its lodge on the area in any place it chooses except at the center. And structures of any kind to be used only by their owners for purposes other than habitation must be placed outside the camp circle, like menstrual lodges, vitalizing lodges, things like that. Walker then names the four virtues in order of their importance. The most important being bravery, followed by fortitude, generosity, and fidelity. Now, I wanted to talk a bit about the cosmology involved in the Sundance. So we have the Wakan Tonka, and uh, Wakan means sacred or holy. Tonka means deep or profound. So we have the Wakan Tonka Washte, which is the, the sacred, profound good. So, or in English, benevolent gods. And we have the Wakan Tonkan Shika, sacred, profound, bad, or the malevolent gods in English. So we have two kinds of benevolent gods, the Wakan King, which are the sacred beings, and the Daku Wakan, the relatives of the sacred beings. Now, in this cosmology, Wakan Tonkan is both one and many. And, and this is sometimes a difficult concept for non-Lakota to understand. So of the gods, <clears throat> or we, could, we might say the spirits um, today, there are the superior gods, or the Wakan Ankanta, and, and the associate gods, or the Wakan Kolawa. So the, the uh, relatives of the gods also have two classes, the Wakan Kuya, the subordinate gods, and the Wakan Lapi, or those that are like gods. So, um, so who are the superior gods or spirits. Well, there's we, 
the sun, who is the chief of, of the gods or the spirits, Shkan, the sky, or Daku Shkashka, the great spirit, that which moves everything that moves, Macha, the earth, the all-mother, Ia, the rock, or the all-father. So, um, so who are the individuals of the associates of the gods or spirits? Well, there's Hongwe, the moon, who is the associate of we, the sun. There's Tate, the wind, who is the associate of Shka, the sky. There's Ochpe, the feminine, the associate of Macha, the mother earth. And Wakia, the winged god or the thunder being, thunder spirit, the associate of Ia, the rock. So um, the subordinate spirits or gods are Tatanka, the buffalo god, Hunompa, the bear god, Tatoba, the four winds, and Yumni, the whirlwind. The godlike individuals are Naki, the spirit, Nia, the ghost, Nahila, the spirit like, and Shikun, which is the imparted supernatural potency or power of one of these beings, of a being. So there is, so here is four individuals who can also be considered as one individual or the chief spirit. They are the sun, the moon, the buffalo, and the spirit or um, shka. So, and then the great spirit consists of the sky, the wind, the bear, and the ghost. And the creator spirit consists of the earth, the feminine, the four winds, and the spirit-like being. And then the executive god consists of Ia, the rock, uh, the winged one, the whirlwind, and the potency. So the great mystery consists of the chief god, the great spirit, the creator, and the executive. It's quite a hierarchy that the Lakota have. So let's talk about the sun, because the sun obviously is the, the most important character of the sun dance, or the dance is to the sun. So the sun makes his journey above the domain of the sky, and at night he rests with his people in the regions under the earth, under the world, and there <clears throat> communes with his comrade, the buffalo. And of course, the buffalo is extremely important in the sun dance, and this is the explanation. The buffalo skull is hung from the tree of life, which is in the center of the sun dance grounds or the arbor. Um, people wear or pull buffalo skulls. Um, the uh, buffalo skulls are used to mark the four gates of the arbor. Um, buffalo, items pertaining to the buffalo are placed in the, in the tree. The, the buffalo spirit or the buffalo god is the patron of the four great virtues that I named earlier, but is indifferent to small matters. And so um, to secure the favor or the help of the buffalo spirit, one must make appropriate offerings and ceremonies. And there may be possible a communication between human and buffalo when one dances the sun dance. So, um, so the sun and the buffalo are inextricably linked. The sun, the power of the sun abides in fire and cannot be imparted to any other thing. His color is red, and because he is the chief of the gods, red is the sac most sacred color. And so often, the Sundance starts at dawn 
and on each day concludes when the shadow of the tree crosses the boundary of the east gate. They say that the the day spirits come with the with the appearance of the sun and leave when the shadow of the tree crosses the east gate, at which time the night spirits take over, come on duty. So uh, what about the sky? The sky is of a substance that is never visible and ranks second among the superior gods. The sky is sometimes called Dakushkashka, Nachitanka, which is great spirit. A Nagi is, is actually more than spirit, more complicated than spirit. But, and we've talked about this before, and we'll come back to it again. But for now, we'll translate it as great spirit. So, so what the word shkan expresses is a vague concept of force or energy. And, and there's, um, when that's added to the word tho, tho, then we ha- which is the blue of the sky, which symbolizes the presence of the great spirit. So the, the domain of, of Shkan is all above the world, beginning at the ground. Shkan is the source of all power and motion and is the patron of directions and trails and of encampment. Shkan imparts to each of mankind at birth a spirit, a ghost, and a shikun. And at the death of each of mankind, Shkan hears the testimony of the ghost and adjudges the man or the woman. So the people of, of Shkan are the stars, and the feminine is his daughter. His power can be imparted only to mysterious things and by much ceremony correctly performed by wise people. So um, his his power can prevail in all things, but only Vikasha Wakan can have such objects that hold the power of Shka. His symbolic color is blue. So uh, third, Ranking third among the superior gods is the earth, which is a material god whose substance is always visible. So she ranks third, even though she existed next after the first in existence. She's most often addressed as the All Mother, for she is an ancestor of all material things except the rock. Her domain is the world, and she is the patron of all things that grow from the ground, of drink and food, and of the home, or the teepee. Her her power can be imparted to anything that is grown from the ground, and her symbolic color is green. The rock is a material god whose substance may always be seen. He ranks fourth among the superior gods, but existed first. He is most often addressed as the All-Father, for he is the ancestor of all things and of all the gods. The rock is the father of Iktomi, whose other parent is the winged god, and the father of Ia, or Ibom, the great god of evil, whose other parent is an Umtehi, or one of the sea monsters. So we'll come back to Iktomi. Iktomi is the often called the evil one, who's always interested in thwarting the wishes of creator and of the sun and of the superior gods. The domain of the rock is the mountains, but his authority extends through all of the earth. He is the patron of authority and vengeance, of construction and destruction, and of implements and utensils. His power can be imparted to anything that is hard as stone, and his symbolic color is yellow. The moon is a material god who can choose to be seen or not. She governs the third time, which is called a moon, and combats Anagite, the double woman. 
Inagite is, is the one who incites contention among the people. The moon has no domain and her power cannot be imparted to anything. However, she fixes the time for the more important undertakings of mankind. But she is indifferent to ceremonies, they say, and cannot be influenced by them. Tate is an immaterial god who is never visible, for he is a spirit. He is the father of the four winds, whose mother is Anagite. He governs the fourth time, which is a year, and the coming and going of the four seasons. He abides at the entrance of the spirit trail and hides it, hides the entrance from mankind. Tate admits or excludes spirits from this entrance according to the judgment of the great spirit, Shkan. He cannot be influenced by sacrifice or ceremony. His power cannot be imparted to anything. The feminine is a material god who may be visible or invisible. She is often addressed as the woman, the beautiful one, or the gracious one. She is the daughter of Shkan, the sky, and is of the star people. She abides in the teepee of Okaga, the south wind, and is his associate. Her power, which cannot be imparted to anything, is the smoke of the chinupa and the smoke of the sweetgrass. Her functions are to harmonize um, her functions are to harmonize and are effective when the chinupa is smoked or sweet grass is burned. She is the mediator between the gods, between the gods and mankind, and between mankind. She is the protector of chastity of little children and the patron of adornment and pleasure. She should be evoked in every ceremony. Wakia is a material god in whose substance is visible only when he so wills. His properties are a calm and anti-natural. He abides in his lodge on the top of the mountain at the edge of the world where the sun goes down to the regions under the world. So, um, Joaquin is many, but only one. He is shapeless, but has wings with four joints. He has no feet, yet he has huge talons. He has no head, yet he has a huge beak with rows of teeth in it, like the teeth of the wolf. His voice is the thunderclap, and rolling thunder is caused by the beating of his wings on the clouds. He has an eye, and its glance is lightning which is why one takes cover when the thunder spirits are in the neighborhood. Um, his lodge is in a great cedar tree. Oh, sorry, in, in a great cedar tree beside his lodge in the West, he has a nest made of dry bones. And, and in that nest is an enormous egg from which his young continually flow. <clears throat> He devours each of his young, and they each become one of his many selves. He, he and the rock had Iktomi, who is the oldest son of the rock. He flies through all the domain of the sky, hidden in a robe of clouds, and if one of mankind sees his substance, he is thereby made a hiyoka, and must ever afterwards speak and act clownishly in an anti-natural manner. <clears throat> Yet, if he so wills, he can appear to mankind in the form of a giant man, and if so, he is then the god, Hayoka. If one looks upon the god, Hayoka, one is not made Hayoka. 
And so the potency of the thunder being or the winged God cannot be imparted to anything. His functions are to cleanse the, the world from filth and to fight the monsters who defile the waters and to cause all increase by growth from the ground. So the acceptable manner of addressing Wakiya is by taunt and vilification, saying the opposite of what one intends with the address. So saying the opposite of what one means is the acceptable way to pray to the thunder spirits. <clears throat> His symbol <clears throat> is a zigzag red line forked at each end. His associates are the dog, the swallow, the snowbird, the nighthawk, the lizard, the frog, and the dragonfly. And we talked about how seeing one of those in a vision will make you hayoka. <clears throat> the buffalo is a material god whose substance is visible only when he so wills. His form is that of a great beast, but he may appear to mankind as a man. He abides with the buffalo people in the regions under the world and roams throughout all the domain of the earth. He is the patron of sexual relations, generosity, industry, fecundity, and ceremonies. He is the protector of maidens and of the very old. He is the comrade of the sun, and in ceremonies pertaining to the sun, his power prevails, which is why the buffalo is so important in the sun dance. He controls the chase and gives or withholds success to hunters. His potency abides in the skull of the, his power, his powers abide in the skull of, of the buffalo and can be imparted to anything that has been part of a buffalo. Moving on, the bear is a material god whose substance is invisible at his will. He may appear to humans as a huge bear or as a very old man. He is the patron of wisdom, medicine, and magic. And anyone who would know the ways of the Lakota should have his help. His powers can be imparted to anything that is strange or unusual. He, the four winds is an immaterial god whose substance is never visible. He is Akan, and therefore no one of mankind can understand him. While he is one God, he is also four individuals. He may be addressed as the four or the four quarters or as the wind of the four directions or as the suns. They are the sons of Tate and their mother is Anagite. They were born at one birth, but Yata came first. Ea, the secondborn, displaced Yata and holds the birthright of the firstborn. And this is a marvelous story about how this happens that hopefully we'll have a chance to tell and is on um, my Buffalo CD from Sounds True. The six CD set, that story takes about an hour to tell. Yampa was the thirdborn and Okaga the lastborn son. So all of these beings had their teepees at the edge of the of the world. Uh, Ia is on the mountain beside the lodge of the winged god. Yata is under the stars that never come down to the edge of the world. <coughs> Yanpa is where the sun begins his daily journey over the world, which would be the east. And Okaga is under where the sun pauses at midday when his journey is half done which would be the south or midday or noon. They do not uh, live in these teepees for they are continually traveling on the trail that circles the edge of the world. And where they are or whence they may come, no one can tell. In ceremonies, they should be dressed as the one God, the four winds and have precedence over all the gods except Wokpe, the feminine. They are jealous of their precedence and of that among themselves. In every ceremony of importance, they should be invoked after the feminine in the following manner. So first one evokes Ia, the west wind. 
Yata, the north wind, Yampa, the east wind, and Okaga, the south wind. Um, <clears throat> so when we light the pipe, when the pipe is lit, it should be elevated with its mouthpiece pointed toward the west and carried so that the mouthpiece pointing toward the edge of the world circles until it points toward the tipi of Yata, which is in the north, where it should be held for an instant, and then carried in the same manner until it points toward the tipi of Yampa, and then held there for an instant. And then it should be carried in the same manner and held it for an instant toward the tipi of Okaga. Okay. So, um, the power of the feminine is tendered in the proper order of precedence to each and all of the four winds. So while the four winds travel continually on the trail around the edge of the world, um, when he comes onto the world, that individual of himself that prevails will give the direction from which he comes. As the four sons of Tate the wind, they established the four directions on the world, and then by the decree of their father were to travel forever on the trail around at the edge of the world. Each completion from beginning to end is a year. Therefore, a circle is an emblem of all four of the units of time, each of which goes in a circle. These are day, night, moon, and year. While the four winds are, as, are one as a god, as the sons of Tate, they are four individuals. Ea is burly and boisterous, he is the associate of the thunder spirits and accompanies him when he flies through the domain of the sky and aids him in cleansing the world. Ea is reckless and often does his work harshly when he prevails and sweeps the world. His akasita is the hawk. Yata is strong, cold, and surly. He is forever fighting with Okaga, the South, because he wanted Wokpe, the feminine, as his own, but Okaga won her as his companion. Because of his surly selfishness, Yatra was deposed from the birthright of the firstborn, and it was given to Ea. His Akisita is the magpie. Yampa is an indolent god whose Akisita is now the crow. Okaga is a pleasing god, and when he prevails, all things rejoice. The feminine Wokpe dwells in his tipi, and is his companion, often traveling with him. The little son of Tate, the whirlwind, also dwells in the tipi of Okaga, and comes forth only when Okaga prevails, for he fears Yata. <clears throat> the Akasita of Okaga are the waterfowl. So, the functions of the four winds are to be the messengers of Shka, the great spirit, and of Tate, their father, and to control the weather. So, they're the ones that one um, invokes or prays to for good weather in the sun dance. The world wind is a merry god. Uh, he's the little son of Tate, and his mother is Anag Ite. But because of a curse placed upon her, he was not born as other children are, and for this reason he remains little, and is not counted with the other sons of Tate, who are counted as the four sons of the wind, with Yumni being his little son. So, Wokpe taught Yumni all the sports and games and gave him control over them. So he is the patron of all gambling, friendly contests, sports, games, and courtship. His um, Yumni has no Akasita, never appears in a vision. His powers may be imparted to any implements for sports or games. 
um, the Wakan Lapi are immaterial gods that abide or have abided in material things. While there are four kinds, there are many of each kind. But all of each kind should be considered as only one when addressing them as spirits. Nagi, the spirit, is an immaterial god whose substance may be visible at its will and who can communicate with mankind directly or through the medium. Shkan imparts a Nagi to each of mankind at birth. The Nagi abides with its recipient until death controlling the disposition and actions of that person. At death, it leaves the body, but lingers near the haunts of the person, awaiting its endowment for the spirit. A spirit is endowed with the nagili, nagila, or spirit-like being of things in the following manner. So one who wishes to contribute to the endowment abandons the thing to be contributed in the name of the deceased when the spirit-like being of the thing becomes the possession of the spirit. So the material of the things thus abandoned is taboo to those who abandon them and become the property of any who may take them. So you can't get stuff back once you give it away. The material of these things thus abandoned is taboo to those who abandon them and become the property of any others who may take them. So the family of a deceased man may abandon all their possessions, endowing his spirit with them, for by so doing, the spirit-like being of these things is taken by his spirit. The material of these things thus abandoned is taboo to those who abandon them and become the property of any others who may take them. So that's the, the philosophy behind the giveaway, especially the giveaway that occurs when someone dies. So if a spirit is adjudged by Shkan as unworthy to go on to the spirit trail, it becomes a shiku, a wandering spirit, and must wander over the, over the world until Tate deems it fitted, when he may permit it to pass through the entrance. Such wandering spirits, which we might call ghosts, can communicate with mankind, but their communications are uncertain and should not be relied upon. They often serve uh, serve a nagi te, whisper malicious things to tattling women, or excite men to jealousy. <clears throat> they may become the familiars, though, of the very old and do their bidding. The Nia is an immaterial god whose substance is visible when it will, so wills. A Nia is imparted by Shkan to each of mankind at birth and abides with the person like a shadow until death when it lingers with the spirit until the latter goes before Shkan for judgment. Then it appears to testify regarding the conduct of the spirit, and upon its testimony the spirit is judged. When Shkan has given judgment, the ghost returns to whence it came and is no more. Its function during the life of the person are its functions are to cause vitality, to forewarn of good and evil, and to give the power to influence others. When it departs from the body, this is death, though it may depart and return again if the spirit has not left the body. The Nagiya is an immaterial god whose substance may at will be seen in any form it chooses to appear. As separate individuals, they are the immaterial selves of material things other than mankind. A Nagiya is imparted by Shkan to each thing at its beginning, remains with it until it ceases to be, and then returns to whence it came. It can be with the thing and separate from it at the same time, as for instance, when it is with the thing, it may at the same time have been given in the endowment of a spirit and taken to the spirit world. It may possess any other thing. For instance, the Nagiya of the wolf may possess a tree, when the tree will have the nature of a wolf, or it may possess one of mankind. For example, the nagia of a bear may possess a man when the man will have the nature of a bear. By proper ceremony, its powers can be imparted to inanimate things, 
as the potency of the nagia of a poison herb may be imparted to powdered clay, or the power of a medicinal thing may be imparted to one of mankind. A thing may be caused by its nagia to speak or act in a supernatural manner and to communicate with mankind. The shikun is an immaterial god whose substance is never visible. It is the power of mankind and the emitted power of the gods. Considered relative to mankind, it is many, but apart from mankind, it is one. Shkan imparts a shikun to each of mankind at birth. It remains with the person until death when it returns to where it came from. Its functions are to enable its possessor to do those things which the beasts cannot do, and to give courage and fortitude. It may be pleased or displeased with its possessor, and may be operative or inoperative according to its pleasure. It may be evoked by ceremony or prayer, but it cannot be imparted to any other person or thing. Most of the gods can emit their powers, and when so emitted, their powers become shikumpi. Such a shikun can be imparted to material things by a proper ceremony, correctly performed, well, Walker calls it a shaman, but I would call that vikasha wakan, or an intercessor. A shikun so imparted must be clothed by proper wrappings about the material it pervades. So, a medicine bundle, in other words. The wrappings may be in the form of a pouch, bag, bundle, or any recept receptacle that will cover and hide the material. The wrapping, the material, and the shikun all together make a washiku. A shikun is operative only when it is part of a washiku. So another way of thinking about the washikun is, is the medicine bundle. So while a washikun may be operative independent of the source of its power, it must be treated with the veneration due to the god that emits its shikun or in all its properties, it is as that god. Thus, while the shikun ranks lowest among the gods, a washikun may have the power of any god except that of Shkan, the great spirit, and of the sun, the chief of the gods. Any oglala who is eligible for conducting a ceremony may choose and have an intercessor prepare for him. Um, a washikun whose power is commensurable with the ceremonies he is allowed to perform. Only intercessors should undertake to conduct ceremonies that pertain to the superior gods. So they, they should have washikun having higher powers. The powers pertaining to that god. So the functions of a washikun or a medicine bundle are to serve its possessor with its supernatural powers, which are effective when properly invoked. When preparing a washikan, the intercessor devises a formula, which must be repeated to invoke its powers. Now, it's my understanding, though, there's always exceptions, that, that every Sundance has a washikan, which is the bundle containing those sacred things, which contain those supernatural powers which are operative in that Sundance. And the leader or the intercessor of that Sundance opens the bundle and these things are, re are removed and placed in the, in the arbor and on the tree. And then the power is invoked to become operative during the dance. So this is put on the tree before the tree is raised. Um, there are also shikun who are dissociated spirits that wander over the world, but they're classified with the malevolent gods. So who are the malevolent gods? This is useful, I think, to know who is the enemy. Ia, or Ibom, is a material god whose substance is visible only at his will. His form is that of an enormous giant, and his predominant property is his appetite. He is the last-born son of Ia, the rock, and his mother is an Untehi, or sea monster. He has no abiding place and wanders over the world seeking to devour all that he gets into his power. He can swallow at one gulp a host of people or a herd of animals. His breath is a miasma and the cause of many diseases. 
He is stupid and frequently the butt of pranks by his older brother, Iktomi. As Ea, he is lured over the other malevolent gods and shares in the evils that they devise. As Ebom, he is a destructive cyclone. He abhors ceremony, fears fire, and flies away from the smoke of sage or sweet grass. The smoke of the Chinupa is repugnant to him. Gnoski, the demon, is a material god whose substance is visible at his will. His form is that of the bull buffalo, like that of the buffalo god. People call him the crazy buffalo. He is fierce and cruel, but he may appear as if he were the buffalo god and thus for the purpose of inciting to crime or cruelty. He may possess a person, and if he controls the spirit, the person is insane. Or if he controls the ghost, the person is paralyzed. He may be exorcised by the, by the smoke of sage and sweetgrass, and can be controlled by the washikun of an intercessor. The Untehi or sea monsters are material gods whose substance is visible, but they hide under the deep waters. Their forms are those of huge reptiles with horns that can be projected to the clouds and tails that beat down forests. They tear the ground with their claws and make deep ravines. They defile waters and make them unfit for use by mankind. They lurk near shore to capture children and in deep waters to take adults. These they hold in bondage under the water or transmogrify them to water animals. The winged god or the thunder spirit is forever at war with the Unktehi, and in battle with them they gore the ground making the badlands where they may be seen in the bones as the bones of Unktehi that were slain. An intercessor whose bundle is of the highest power can subdue the Unktehi and drive them away and can undo their magical deeds. There are the mini, wat, mini Watu or water sprites who are material beings whose substance is visible except too small to be seen. And of course, it's interesting to see that the Lakota had germ theory before Pasteur. Their form is that of maggots and they cause things to rot. They ever seek entrance into the bodies of mankind and lurk in the waters to do so. When in the body, they pinch the bowels or pull the cords of the joints or beat upon the brain, for they delight in the sufferings of mankind. They are ever at war against the Nia or ghost, and if they prevail, the ghost leaves the body. This would be um, dying of sepsis, for instance, overwhelming infection but they may be exercised in a vitalizing lodge by an intercessor or a wikasha wakan or wikasha pejuta. The kan oti or forest dwellers are elves who wander in lonely places and bewilder mankind so that directions and locations are not recognized. These elves can assume the forms of beast or birds for the purpose of enticing mankind into their power. The smoke of the Chinupa or the power of the four winds can defeat their purposes. The Ungla are goblins who haunt deserted places and lurk at night in teepees where they may appear. Um, they frighten timid people and children and cause distressing dreams. They fear the power of the sun and fly from it as it is shown in the light from a fire. They're cunning and malicious mannequins who are visible or invisible at their will. The, Nag Nagilap the Nagilapi, obnoxious things, are classed with the malevolent gods. So uh, the potency, the power of a, of a malignant god or malevolent god can be imparted to material by a wizard, a wikasha, a munga. <coughs> the material thing is thereby made powerful to do that which the, the god can do or the spirit can do and is subservient to its possessor. So an intercessor can invoke the potency of either or of all the malevolent gods and make it operative or inoperative.
Ektomi, the firstborn son of the rock, or Ea, was a god until the great spirit dissociated him from the gods and condemned him to wander forever over the world without friend or associate, which is why he's so angry and always trying to thwart the plans of the creator or the son or the great spirit. Um, because his other parent is the shapeless winged god or thunder spirit, his normal shape is queer, but he may appear as a handsome young man. He has the powers of a god, but is a myths anthropic being and delights in making others the butts of ridicule. He is crafty and cruel, but is often the victim of his own schemes. He invented languages and gave common names to all things. He can converse with mankind and with the Nagalapi, but he talks more often with other things. He is often with Ia, his younger brother, and then he exercises his birthright of the firstborn son, demands obedience of Ia, and causes him to do ridiculous things. If Iktomi is present during a ceremony, he will scheme to make it ridiculous and an offense to the gods, or he is an imp of mischief. In whatsoever form he may appear, an intercessor can detect him, and by the aid of the medicine bundle, or washikun, restore him to his normal shape and drive him away. Wazia is the old man, the wizard, who received from Iktomi the powers of a god. Because of this, the great spirit decreed that his ghost should remain with him forever and that he should dwell alone on the world. He is the husband of Kanka and the father of Anag Ite, and thus the grandfather of the four winds. <clears throat> his teepee is in the same location as that of Yata, the north wind, but Yata does not dwell inside of it. <clears throat> he is always seen coming from the direction of his teepee and can enter a teepee or lodge only when the door opens toward the north. In summer and winter, he is heavily clothed with furs, for he is cold and his presence causes chilliness. His presence at a ceremony will chill the rites and make the gods indifferent to them. He is an irascible being and quick to vent his anger, but he may be kind and helpful to one who pleases him. The wandering spirits are his familiars and they do his bidding. He is the adversary of the intercessors and interferes with their works. Sage is repugnant to him and he will not come near it and will leave whenever it is burned. Wakanka is the old woman, the witch, the wife of Wazi and the mother of Anagi Te. She is the grandmother of the four winds. She is a seer and because of this she induced her husband to purloin the powers of a god and incited her daughter to profane the disposition of the sun. She schemed with Iktomi to accomplish these things. Because of this, Shkan doomed her forever to dwell alone in the world. Her, te her teepee is old, smoky, and ragged, and it's where she places it. She appears to young men and young women as a decrepit woman in want of something and begs of them for what she wants. According to the disposition that they manifest in the treatment of her, she foretells their good or evil fortune and may give that which will make her prediction come true. If her purpose be evil, an intercessor by the aid of his medicine bundle can thwart her. Anagite is the daughter of Wazi and Kanka. She was the wife of Tate and gave him four sons at one birth. She was the most beautiful of women, but was vain. When she was again with child, she was incited by the scheming of her mother, Enictomi, to attempt an affair with the sun and thus desecrated the seat of the moon and brought shame upon Tate. Because of this, Shkan doomed her to abide on the world forever and to have two faces, one enticingly beautiful, the other so horrible that one seeing it would either flee from her or go mad, to give forth her child without birth so that it would always be little and that her children should know her no more as a mother. Kind of harsh. She foments scandal and jealousies and torments pregnant women. She plagues babies with pains and fears. She promotes illicit love affairs and adultery. She is afraid of old men and old women and abhors the bark and twigs of the cottonwood, for they will offend, for they will fend against her scheming, which is why the Sundance tree is often a cottonwood. The intercessors should oppose her, for with the aid of their medicine bundles they can overcome her and her works. 
The stars are a supernatural people, the people of the sky. They are indifferent to the affairs of mankind, but they may come down to the world and mingle with the people, and some of them have even married among the Lakota. They are beyond the province of an intercessor, for they are the people of Shkan who controls them. The buffalo people are those who dwell in the regions under the world and are the people of the sun. Waziah was their chief, but when he was deposed, they chose the buffalo god to be their chief, and he is so. They have the power to transmogrify and may appear on the world as animals or as of mankind and may mingle with the Lakota and become their spouses. They can transmogrify those spouses and take them to the regions under the world. The offspring of a buffalo person and a Lakota has the powers of its buffalo parent and controls its other parent. A, a Lakota, a spouse to a buffalo person or having buffalo children, can be freed from their control only by an intercessor whose medicine bundle has the power of the buffalo god. Very old people. A very old man or a very old woman because of age and experience may have supernatural powers which they can use for good or evil and only an intercessor can defeat their harmful purposes. Here's some thought about a menstruating woman which, who is women who are excluded from Sundance. They say, Walker says, a woman during her menstrual flow is susceptible to control by Ganaski and Anagite and is an easy dupe of Iktomi. During this time, she should live alone and an intercessor should not permit her presence during a ceremony. So these are the characters that are, are at play, at work, operating in the dance grounds, around the arbor, being invoked, being propitiated, being mollified, being controlled, being excluded. And many activities are done in order to move forward among these beings. So um, it's complicated and it's worthy of greater study than we can do in this time. But um, Probably all fabulous cosmologies fall into that category. I wanted to finish today with talking about some a paper just recently published online, 3 February 2017, called uh, Implications for Education, Mapping and Complication Complicating Conversations about Indigenous Education. And... Um, and so it's about um, efforts to listen and to be taught by the land and to avoid institutionalization, about experimenting with an experiential pedagogy based on ancestral teachings. And uh, the, the author and his students were invited by Blackfoot elders to take the students to witness a Sundance. And so um, he calls this... Uh, a complicating conversation. And together with the elders, they designed a course that is not about studying the Sundance, but about students studying their own response to the invitation of the elders to participate in this collective process of renewal and reconciliation on the land's terms. The pedagogy consists of three simple teachings, learning to presence, to resonate, to release, and to balance. Students read texts about the history of the Sundance and its prohibitions, about sacred pain, and about the practice of observing themselves observe, which involves interrupting their desire to create narratives and rationalizations for their experiences. They spend about 10 days camping in the site, immersed in communal relationships, teachings, and indigenous protocols. Once decontextualized in a place without running water or the comforts that affirm their self-image, students are invited to practice the pedagogy as they witness the ceremony. <clears throat> the practice of presencing involves bracketing thinking in order to allow the whole body to sense and become vulnerable to its surroundings. The practice of resonance involves tuning into the rhythms of the place, 
the drumbeat, the dance, and the prayers. Students are told that they do not have to believe in anything, but rather believe with the community, allowing themselves to be in community without relying on certainties and convictions. And this is the goal that we have uh, for participants in this program. We'll finish with just some images. The Anipi Kaga, the medicine circle or the altar, well, the circle within the square altar. And, and that's all for today. And um, we will continue with the next program. Thank you for watching.